right, amen. It's good to be saved. It's good to be in church. Exodus chapter 14. Uh, we're going to start right there in verse 1. All right, Exodus chapter 14, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before a nice uh, unpronounceable Jewish word there, Pihithera, between Migdal and the sea, over against Belzephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say uh, of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Let's pray, Father, again, it is good to be saved. And it's good to be in church, and Lord, we just ask you to bless the message, Lord, and may your words always be spoken. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now last week I started a, a little series, and we're going to continue this for a while. I don't know how long. I mean, Exodus has got 40 chapters. I don't think I'm going to preach. You know, we didn't even do the first 12 chapters. <laughs> but there's a theme in all of this, and uh, last week's theme, if you remember, was what? Purposes in the wilderness, okay, and that's what we preached on. Now, just by review, all right, 2020 was a rough year for many of us. 2020 was a rough year for the church. Uh, and again, by quick review, we looked at some uh, statistics of the state uh, and stats of the American church. And according to Christian research firm Barner, uh, one in three practicing Christians have stopped attending church during the pandemic. So that means that 33% of People that used to go to church before the pandemic have stopped. All right, half of uh, church adults have not streamed the church life, uh, church service recently. All right, uh, another study said was just three in church, three out of ten uh, churchgoers have not had any contact with a church leader uh, recently during the during the pandemic. Um, you guys know me, and uh, I try to reach out to people, even the ones that, that you know, felt that belong to our church and are even members but have not been coming. I do call them. I do text them. Uh, some people are very open and receptive, and, yeah, Pastor, I'm coming back. And other people have just kind of slipped off the edge a little bit. I don't know where they are. They haven't responded. But, uh, you know, a lot of people have said that they're just staying in until this thing gets better. All right? But... Uh, three in ten uh, are not communicating with the deacons or the pastor or church staff. Right? In this time of the social distancing and isolation, uh, Barna reports that people are starting to suffer even psychologically. They feel confined. They feel alone. Right? They feel a little hopeless. Right? American church, America's churches have stepped into the physical unknown. Right? Barna reports that 66% of uh, churches have noted a major decrease in, in, uh, in giving. And currently, around 23% of churches are uh, considering laying off uh, staff or cutting back uh, their church budgets because uh, they just don't know how to keep the building running. Now, you know, look, that was kind of the negative stuff. Now, praise God, I think things have stabilized a little bit. Some churches that were closed have opened up. Uh, some churches that have, uh, you know, closed have gone online and they're just kind of chugging along. But I do think that there is a little light at the end of the, the tunnel. Uh, you know, I think that we are, hopefully this year, get out of this uh, pandemic thing. And, you know, praise God that we can still be an active church. Now, sadly, though, for many churches, the ministry for 2021 is, is not reaching the lost, which is the Great Commission. But their ministry has become, how do we reach the one-third that have left? I mean, you know... Uh, Barna goes on to say, and I didn't, you know, this is a very lengthy article that he wrote, but he went on to say that a lot of the people that have stopped coming to church weren't like faithful, you know, they once a month or once every two months, it's just they kind of used the pandemic for an excuse to not come to church, and that's kind of sad. But hey, the, we love them, we need to reach out to them, we want them to know that they have a home here, we want them to know that they, they feel loved, and uh, we want to get... You know, as many people as we can worship in God. All right? It's not about me. It's not about the building. It's not about the bagels. It's about what's that first song that we sang. It's about him. Hi. All right? It's all about him. All right? Now, so what's the connection here between the children of Israel and the exodus and the wilderness? Now, remember, what does the word exodus mean? 
We're exiting, we're exiting out of here. We're getting out of here. <laughs> okay? And I believe here the connection that I'm, I'm trying to bring out here is that the connection is, is that sometimes God brings you individually uh, out of something or out of some place or out of some condition. Uh, sometimes he'll, you know, bring uh, you or the church or in this, you know, the story of Exodus, he's bringing an entire nation out of their place, which was where they were in Egypt, into the wilderness. All right? He brings an entire nation of people into the wilderness. And what can we learn from the Israelites wandering the desert for 40 years? All right? Why does God bring us to the wilderness? And last week we looked at four points. All right? Point number one was God brings us into the wilderness is because God makes men and women build character in the wilderness. And we looked at many of the Bible greats that had, uh, had gone into the wilderness. All right? Another reason why God brings us to the wilderness is because God led the way. Remember, they were just not wandering aimlessly. God said, I will lead you. All right? I will send a cloud to protect you from the sunlight during the day. And I'm going to send you a cloud of fire during the night to lead you. God was the leader. All right? Another reason why God brings us into the wilderness is because God may want to take you in a different direction. The Israelites knew that the easiest point was to go boop, right across, get, you know, right into the right, right, right over there, right into the into the land of Canaan. And God said, "No, you're going to go around the long way." And you say, "Why?" Uh, because God knows best. God's the leader, and sometimes God will take us in a different direction. You may you may be thinking A to B is easy. You know, all I got to do is go here. And God's saying, no, before you get to B, you're going to go loop-de-loop -loop all, all over the place. And remember, he took him in the, he led him in the wilderness for 40 years. All right, and again, point number four, despite review, God brings us into the wilderness because God provided guidance and protection in the wilderness. All right, and that was our message from last week, and I'd just like to kind of continue that thought because... Uh, you know, we're just, we just went from a little bit of Exodus chapter 13, and you know, now we're going to go in, go in here into Exodus chapter 14. Now, Exodus chapter 14 is a great Bible chapter, and it records the events of the passage uh, of the Red Sea by the children of Israel and the overthrow of Pharaoh. Uh, how many people have ever watched the movie The Ten Commandments with, you know, Charlton Heston? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, you know they, they showed that every year on Channel 2. It was like a three-hour movie, four hours with commercials. and you know. But as a little boy, I watched that and I'm thinking, this is, this, is like, this is what really happened in the Bible. You know? And I would actually say that as a very, you know, very biblically accurate. You know, of course, Hollywood Ed, Ed lives a little here, but when Charlton has to take that rod and the seas part, you're like, wow, man. <laughs> who, who directed that movie? I know Don knows, Cecil probably. Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille. All right. You got, I see you old timers. If you're over, if you're over 80, you all know. Cecil B. DeMille. That's right. But uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll do a church movie. Or, might not, we'll watch the Ten Commandments yeah, here. But, good idea. Yeah, good idea. We'll get out the old winter popcorn machine and some sodas, and we'll, yeah. we'll watch, we'll watch uh, Cecil B. DeMille's uh, Ten Commandments. Now, the story of the Exodus here, uh, we have some great... Uh, analogies here. And as we preach and study, you know, the, the book of Exodus here, uh, we have the Exodus, the journey through the wilderness, the children entering the promised land. Uh, just keep in mind, maybe in the back of your head, some analogies, some types, or pictures. Because we have the actual story of the Exodus of the children of Israel, but there are types and pictures of the Bible and analogies here. Right? The story of the Israelites and their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land is a type of a picture uh, from Egypt, leaving Egypt to sin, all right? Because Egypt is a type of picture of sin, and entering, leaving sin, and going towards the Promised Land. Right? Egypt is a type or a picture of sin and bondage to the service of Satan. Pharaoh is a picture or a type of Satan. God sending Moses to deliver Israel is a type uh, or picture of God sending Jesus Christ for us New Testament believers. All right? Re Moses is a remarkable type of Jesus Christ in, in many particulars. All right? Israel's crossing of the Red Sea represents the Christian's baptism into Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
Israel's entering the wilderness is the figure of the Christian's probation in the church. All right, that just means that they were in the, their their journey is just like our journey here in the church. All right, before we get to the promised land, we're still in the wilderness. All right, the wilderness is a type of picture of the church. All right, uh, the Israel uh, that Israel sinned and that many did not enter the promised land is also a warning that quote not all Christians uh, go to he go to the promised land. You say what? What does that mean? Well, not everybody goes to church to save. Not everybody goes to church as a believer. And that's the same thing here with the, with the, the Israelites here as well. Not all of them made it. Right? Canaan, the promised land, is a type of picture of heaven. The Jordan River is a type of picture of death. All right? And I believe that God wants to bring his people uh, through the wilderness. So let's look at Exodus chapter 14 here. Uh, starting in verse 1, we've read this before, but we'll go over this again. And the Lord spake unto Moses. You know, it's easy to just kind of blow over that verse, but isn't that interesting that God spoke to Moses? I, I think that's pretty cool, you know? It's not like Moses just said, well, I'm going to take this upon myself. Or, but God spoke to Moses. You know, Moses, yes, it's God. Oh, but you have to what can I do for you? Oh, you're going to leave the children soon. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. Me? Yeah, you. Couldn't be. Then who? No, no. It's Moses. God spoke to Moses. And God said to Moses, speaking to the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pithira and between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, and the wilderness hath shut them in. Right. God brings us to the wilderness because sometimes God is the great tactician of your life. And what we could say here in the first four verses of Exodus chapter 14 is that God is setting an ambush or a little booby trap uh, for Pharaoh. You say, why? God knows, <laughs> God knows the beginning from the end. And he says, he says to Moses, turn and encamp before these cities by the sea. And then he's going to say, well, Pharaoh's going to think that they're entangled in the land. Pharaoh's going to think, well, hey, the Israelites, they're here by the, before the Red Sea. They're in this town, this mountain, this town. And I'm just going to march right in in front of them and wipe them out. And God says, I, I'm going to set a little ambush for him. It's kind of like this quiet area over here. You ever watch like the World War I movies and it's like they got the barbed wire and that movie? It's just you try to navigate through this sometimes. You just get all <laughs> tripped up and tangled up. And I mean, you know, if anyone can ever get out of line, I'm just going to take some <laughs> choir wire and wrap you around and you'll, you'll, we'll take, you'll be nice and old tiny there. But we could say God is setting an ambush. For Pharaoh, verse 3, for Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, and the wilderness hath shut them in. So in Pharaoh's mind, oh boy, yeah, these people left, but look where they're heading. I'm going to head towards these guys, but God's setting a trap for them. All right? And it's kind of sad, but even after the ten plagues, and especially the horror of the death of the firstborn, the change in Pharaoh's heart was only temporary. Now, remember the movie, you know, after the firstborn dead, you know, Charlton Heston came up on Aaron, and there's, uh, oh, who's, Yule Brenner. I, I got that one. I answered my own question. He, he was the Pharaoh. And what happened? Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, okay, you guys, you can go. But that didn't last too long, because soon after the children of Israel left, Pharaoh got his heart hardened, and he said, I'm going to pursue after these guys. I'm either going to re-enslave them, or I'm going to wipe them out especially what had happened to his land uh, and the ten plagues. All right, in verse 4, God says that, fa that Pharaoh shall follow after them. He was quick to strike Israel when he thought he had the chance. God knew that Pharaoh wanted to attract, uh, attack the children of Israel. God knew that Pharaoh's heart was hardened and that God, God even hardened Pharaoh's heart even more. But God had a plan. God was setting an ambush for him. God was setting a little booby trap for him. How many people have heard of the D-Day Normandy invasion? I think, yeah. Brother Gordon, you might have you might have actually been there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Got off the pontoon boat and with the machine gun and get me some get me some Germans. Yeah. Actually, some of you guys remember little Henry. 
He yeah. died two years ago, 95, 96 years old. He was a World War II vet, and he actually was on Normandy. The Normandy. Yeah. But Normandy invasion, it was the turning point of World War II, all right, in Europe and with the Allied troops here. And what had happened was, uh, I got a whole bunch of notes, but I'm going to try to explain it to you. The German forces were in Belgium, they were in northern France, they were also in Norway, and they knew that there was some kind of attack that was going to come. All right, there's spies and there's kind of telegrams and things are going around. But what the Allies did was they set an ambush and a little booby trap and, and, and by through diversion. All right, the Allies used misinformation techniques to convince Hitler that they were 350,000 Allied troops stationed in Scotland ready to invade Norway and other parts of Europe, not France. All right, and in, in April of 1944, the radio and airwaves over Scotland were humming about communication and the bustling movements of trucks and troops and all sorts of things. That was nothing. That's just the guy sitting in the shack talking on his radio. There were no 350,000 troops, but the Germans thought that they were there. The Germans thought they may have attacked Norway and swung down, all right? Thus, the Allies are winning the battles of their minds, and what had happened, is that German airplanes would send reconnaissance airplanes over Scotland and they would take photographs of, of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the tanks and the cannons and it turned out that the tanks were just blow-ups, <laughs> you know, like the Christmas blow-ups and the cannons were made out of cardboard and wood. So the Germans thought that, oh man, they're all, they're all like over here. And then meanwhile, what happened? Eisenhower D-Day came in to Normandy, which is a little bit more uh, to, the, to the west than, the, than what they thought, and the Germans were not really prepared. They thought they was the, they didn't think Normandy was the last place. And what happened is the Allies won the battle of the mines, and eventually they won World, through, uh, World War II. Misleading an enemy is a strategy dating back not just to World War II, but for almost eternity. Right, how many people have heard of, uh, I know this guy, Sun Tzu, if you watch the History Channel. I know, Don, you know all this stuff. <laughs> what, I, what's the name of the book that he wrote? Okay. Uh, Come on, The Art oh, of the oh, War. Oh, oh, the Art of War. Yeah, yeah I, I actually, uh, I have that book, all right? Not that I use it for church strategy or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 10 years ago I had, I had to break out Sun Tzu there, but... Uh, no, he says that, and he, he's supposed to be the expert, expert there. All war is based on deception. And to him, the greatest battle was one that was not fought. All right? That's interesting. So we all know, now we got a little history lesson about World War II. Right? Now, Psalms 37, verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. And what's happening is that God is giving the nation of Israel some marching orders. All right? And I believe that God has given the New Testament church and the individual Christian believer marching orders as well. Like God, God's the leader. God gives the steps. You may think that all is lost in the wilderness. You know, wait till we get out later on and out, out of chapter, well, even at the end of chapter 14 and 15, and we're going to find out that the, these children of Israel... They were really a bunch of crybaby complainers driving Moses crazy, but we're not there yet. Right now they're still trusting in the Lord, but they think that maybe, oh no, we're in the wilderness. We got the Red Sea in front of us, this town here, this town there, Pharaoh's off, marching, marching towards us. You might think that all is lost in the wilderness. You might lose hope in the wilderness. You might think that marching around the, the wilderness all those times with the lions and tigers and bears of my and the scorpions and the 12 inch centipedes and the rattlesnakes and the tarantulas and the black widow spiders, you know, and the sand, they was going to get them. And, and, and you know what? But God says, I got better plans for you. I got something better. There's something better on the other side of the Red Sea. And that's the promised land. And that's where I'm going to lead you. And that's what God says to us New Testament Christians. All right, you live in New York. You got crazy pastor driving honking horns. You got high taxes. You, you, got, they got, you got crazy government. You got this and that. But God says, this is just a temporary home. This is the wilderness. I got something better for you on the other side. That's heaven. Amen. That's eternal life. Right, no, no honking and 
heaven. I'm sure God's going to straighten me out on that. Brother Hank, yes, Lord. You drove like a nut. <laughs> Don't give me this. The Lord's work requires haste routine. I know one of these. Maybe I should say it. One of these days, I'm going to give the wrong person the horn. And this guy's going to be like seven feet two, like 300 pounds. He's going to grab me. I'm going to say, please don't hit me. I'm an old man. <laughs> no, don't give me that routine, buddy. Uh, all right. Okay. All right. That's all right. But God says, I, get a, I got better plans for you on the other side. God says, you're no longer a sin, a slave to sin. You're no longer a slave to the Pharaoh. Egypt is not your home. The devil, the Pharaoh, is not your leader. I'm bringing you to the other side. I'm bringing you to the promised land. And all that God ever asked the children of Israel to do, and all he's ever asked us to do here in the church, is to love him, follow him, and believe in him. All right? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It doesn't get any... There's no complicated formula. I mean, you don't got to give a lot of money to the church, but we'll take it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, we got the, what's this, the mega ball? You know, I always talk about that or two or three times a year, not $900 million. I know us fine Christians, we don't, you know, play games of chance, but one of you do win. Remember, the church gets 10%. <laughs> I want to see that check. $90 million wins to heaven the Bible church. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd be like, Wayne, give me a check for 20 grand. I'm going to go get me a, a Lincoln Continental. I'm going to get the Man of God car. I'm going to be driving that thing up and down Windsor Avenue. Woo! And we'll, we'll help the poor. We, we, we'll get some. We'll get through the food pantry thing. But uh, what am I talking about? $900 million. And you know. Someone from like Kentucky, you know, or, you know, uh, Tennessee, you know, some from Yahoo out there. Yeah, I just went to the gas station and I like won't be a dollar ticket. And meanwhile, so you pay two hundred dollars. You know, he's gonna win it all. It always happens that way. Uh, Egypt is not your home. God says, just believe in me, love me, and follow me, and even love me and follow me and believe in me, even when I take you through the wilderness. Another reason why God brings us through the wilderness is to remind us, all right, and to remind our enemies who God really is. Look at verse 4 here. And God speaking here, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all of his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. You see, God, you know, Pharaoh wasn't through with the Israelites. Let me tell you something. God wasn't through with this evil man, Pharaoh. All right? God had one more judgment that would mete out the very judgment that he deserved. If you remember, what's the whole story of Moses in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 1? Right? It was Pharaoh who ordered the death of all Hebrew male children. Remember that? All right? All right? And what happened? Little Moses' mom said, I don't want to kill my, my son. Put him in a little ark, a little boat. Kind of pushed him out to the Nile, you know, at the Nile River there. And it was Pharaoh's daughter that found him. He survived the thing. Now, we know what's going to happen here at the end of chapter 14. The very fate that Pharaoh set for those babies, dying in the, in the water and killing all the babies, the same thing would be happening to Pharaoh. We'll, we'll get to that in a week or two. I would joke the gun here. All right, but, you know, uh, <laughs> Pharaoh was going to get what he deserved. All right? Pharaoh had promised again and again to let the people go, but he never had any intentional desire to do so. Time and time again, he would change his mind and not let the people go. Now, the word Pharaoh, all right, I did a little study here. Now, the word Pharaoh... Uh, the Pharaoh title here in ancient Egypt was a political and religious leader of the people. In fact, the title means uh, Lord of Two Lands. It's sort of like the Queen of England, all right? or the King of England. Right now, we, they got a queen there. She's, quote, the political leader, but she's also in charge of the Church of England. Right? She has two titles. All right? Now, Pharaoh here means Lord of the Two Lands. 
and the high priest of every temple. The word pharaoh is from the Greek form of the Egyptian para or para, and it was a designation of royal residence, meaning great house. And it was the residence for the king or the leader of the people. As supreme ruler of the people, the pharaoh was considered a god, small g, on the earth, and an intermediary between the gods and the people. When Pharaoh came to the throne, he was instantly associated with Horus, the god who had defeated the forces of chaos and restored order. And when he died, he was associated, associated with Boreas, the god of the dead. And such in his role of the high priest of every temple, it was Pharaoh's job to build temples, monuments, celebrating his own great achievements, and also paying homage to the pagan gods of Egypt. Again, God small g. But Pharaoh, we have one little problem here. There's only one God, there's only one Lord, and that's Jehovah God. Right? Psalm 18.31 says, For who is God? Save the Lord. And who is the rock? Save our God. 1 John 5.7 says that there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Moses would later write in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind. There's only one God, that's the Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitals, all right? That's just old King, when you ever see it, all four capitals, L-O-R-D, that's just King James for Jehovah. All right? There's only one rock, that's God. There's only one great high priest, that's Jesus. There's only one King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that's Jesus Christ. Pharaoh's got nothing on the Lord. Ain't no man, no Pharaoh, no devil gonna rob God of his glory. Psalm 57, 11 says, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let thy glory be above the earth. Let's do a little mini Bible study here. You can stay in one finger in Acts uh, 14, but go uh, in Exodus 14, but turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. We're just going to look at a couple of verses here, and we're going to look at what happens when someone tries to equate, equate themselves or try to rob uh, some, some of the glory from God. All right? Acts chapter 12. All right? This is what's going to happen when you try to rob uh, God of his glory. Acts chapter 12. Uh, look at verse 20. So we're just going to read uh, four or five verses here. All right? Acts chapter 12, verse 20. And Herod... Uh, he's, uh, you know, descendant of the Herod from, you know, uh, Jesus, the, Bible, the Christmas story here. And Herod, he was the king there. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him. And, and having made uh, Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. So Herod had a problem with these uh, Ty uh, Sire, Tyre and Sidon. They made peace and everything's uh, pretty good. All right, and then you know, King Herod here, and upon a set, uh, set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, okay, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. I can just imagine, you know, King Herod, royal apparel, you know. He got the purple things, the white things. He got his crown. I mean, maybe someone's holding his little trail there, something. And then he sits down, or he's standing, and he gives an oration. I'm the king, I'm King Herod, look at me, look at me, look at me. And verse 22, uh, and the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a god, against small g, and not of man. Now, I'm not adding to the Bible, but there should be like, you know, and God gave King Herod a, 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 a minute or two to think about what was happening. But apparently, King Herod was soaking it all up. Look at me. I'm the king. They love me. They are calling me a god. And maybe he got a little full of himself. And immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And just to make sure that he proved the point here, God, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Woo! Imagine that. Angel of the Lord comes by. Herod. Zap, worms, do your thing, <laughs> and he died. Listen, uh, 
<sighs> but the word of God grew and multiplied. The evil king died because he tried to rob God of a little of his glory. God wouldn't put up for that, killed the man for it. But God, he gets the glory. His word always multiplies. It's his kingdom. It's his church. It's his word. Listen, sometimes, sometimes you guys come to me after the service and say, oh, Pastor, that was a great message. Oh, boy. It's easy. To, well, you know, what can I say? You know, hey, I'm Pastor Hank. I mean, I'm like Mr. Big Shot here, you know. Oh, if I did that, I, that's, that verse scares me. God, zap, angels, worms, uh, goodbye, babe, you, you didn't inherit my hundreds, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and you guys that do that, you know what I always say? I say, thank you for the, your kind words, all praise, honor, and glory to him. Anything that comes out good out of me came from him. And if I tell you my pastor, Hank, stupid, hon, hon, that, that's me, because I'm in the flesh. I'm human. I, I'm not God. Boy, when, when, when I get to heaven, I'm, I'm going to be on my head. <laughs> really, it's all about him. God gets the glory. Now let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Let's see what God has to say about this glory here. See, we're doing like a little mini Bible story, a uh, little a Bible study here, but we're going back to Exodus here. See, we had one man, Herod, that wanted to be king or wanted the praise of uh, being a god. But go to Philippians chapter 2. All right, Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5. All right, let this be, uh, in verse 5, let this be, uh, let this mind be in you. All right, this is, you know, Paul saying, hey, pay attention here. Which was about who? Which is also Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to who? The glory of God the Father. God gets the glory, and his son gets the glory. Not Pharaoh, not King Herod, not any man. All right? One day, Pharaoh will bow down before the Lord Jesus and confess him to be Lord of Lords, King of Kings, to the glory of God the Father. Sometimes because God is a great a tactician in your life. Another reason why God brings you through the wilderness is to remind you and our enemies who God really is. He's the Lord. And lastly today, another reason why God brings us through the wilderness is to show us. Uh, I struggle with this point, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say it. I may change it. We do a little edit later on. But another reason why God brings us through the wilderness is to show us how stupid the enemy is. All right. All right? Sometimes God is showing us, he's showing the children of Israel how stupid Pharaoh really is. All right? In Exodus 14, uh, verse uh, 5 says, And it was told of the king of Egypt that when the people fled, and the heart of the Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we let Israel go from serving us? That's kind of a stupid question to ask. Why are we letting these people go? A dog, ten plagues, a dog, your first son was killed, uh, a dog, you told them that they can leave. But again, Pharaoh, again, if you watch the movie, The Ten Commandments, um, you run it. He struggled with it. Okay, go. No, no, you can't go. No, you can go. No, no, don't go. And he would change and change and change. He finally let him go, and it starts a marching in the wilderness. He says, no, that's it. No, we, we got we to gotta, we gotta go back and get these guys. All right, but, why they, but why they would ask that question that after God put the hurt on them for the ten plagues and let the sun die and everything, all right? But it was a strange question, but it demonstrates how often people actually forget about God, and it demonstrates that Pharaoh either had a short temper or a short memory, or maybe it's like we say in New York, you're a little stupid, man, you're a little stupid. <laughs> Perhaps Pharaoh was thinking that the plagues were the limit of God's power. Eh, maybe he did 10, but he can't do no more. 
All right? And now it's his turn to get his revenge. Again, how strange it is to Pharaoh, after all the pain and loss he endured through the ten plagues, would now be determined once again to go against not just the children of Israel, but ultimately, who is he going against? Going against God. God never loses. <laughs> Pharaoh, you're stupid. All right? And what happens, we get to read this story, because Moses wrote, here, you know, wrote this here, but this is an analogy here in our spiritual life. We sometimes think that when we leave Satan, that he'll just leave us alone. Some of us think like, well, I got Jesus Christ, John 3, 16. The devil's never going to bother me. Oh, you want to know something? The devil usually leaves you alone when you're not a Christian because he knows you're enjoying your life. But the minute you turn away from him and you go to God, the devil's like, uh-oh, we get on the back phone here. All right, demon 12, demon 13, go, go get Brother Gordon. He's, a, he's going to church again. He's reading his Bible. We, yeah. And what happens is, just like the children of Israel had left, all right, they thought they were getting away from Pharaoh, and that just made Pharaoh more mad. And just like when you become a more faithful Christian, the devil's going to be hot breathing down your back. Double dip guarantee. All right? Verse 6 here in Exodus 14. Here's Pharaoh. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chari uh, chariots, all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And this indicates that Pharaoh himself participated in the event. He just didn't tell his army, okay, go get the Israelites. He's like, no, get me my chariot, all right, um, get me my 600 captains, we're going, we're going to get these buzzards, all right? And what happens is we can indicate from, you know, the passages later on in Exodus 14 that Pharaoh himself drowned uh, in the, in, in the, in, in the uh, pursuing attack. Right? Pharaoh had the best military resources. Chariots were the most sophisticated military technology available at the time. Israel had nothing. All right? they, had a, they had a sack of clothes and they just marched in five in the wilderness being led by Moses, but ultimately being led by God. And it's God who's going to fight the battle and it's God who always wins and never loses. All right? Pharaoh had the best military resources. But Israel went with faith and boldness. All right, verse 8 here says, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Now the question I asked when I read this is like, it's easy just to read the you know, little story here. Is why would God, and I'm sure some of you Bible students are thinking this as well, why would God harden the heart of Pharaoh? You know, God's playing like some little mind games on, on, on Pharaoh or something. All right? But let's remember the historical context here. Remember, it was the Pharaohs who enslaved God's people for over 400 years. Remember Exodus 1.16. It was the Pharaoh who ordered the Israelites to kill all male babies at birth. Exodus 8 verse 15 says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. All right? Exodus 8, 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord has said. All right, what is this happening here? Pharaoh's got a, a, a sin problem. He's got a pride problem. And what is Proverbs 16, 18 says? Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And oh boy, Pharaoh's going to, he's full of pride. He's going to take a big fall here. And let me tell you something about God here. God could have destroyed Egypt during those 400 years. All right? God could say, hey, you enslaved my people. All right? He, he could have just killed all the pharaohs. He could have just wiped them. He could have given Israel everything. But God's a patient God. And what about the ten plagues? All right? Until the last one, the first nine didn't kill anyone. All right? He got some flies and locusts and frogs and things. But these are ten plagues chances of opportunity for the Pharaoh to truly repent. You know, listen, Pharaoh's a man. Right? He could have said, hey, you know what? Man, these frogs, Moses, you know what? Your God's stronger than my God. I submit. Go. I love you. Be in peace. Oh boy, God would have blessed Pharaoh. But each plague that went by, Pharaoh's heart got hardened, got hardened, got hardened, and got hardened. Okay? And what happens 
is that God eventually runs out of grace, runs out of mercy. He says, wow, you're hard in your heart? I'll, I'll even make it harder for you. And God gave up on him here. All right? Moses here later reminds the children of Israel, Numbers 32, he says, uh, verse 23, but if ye will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. All right, and that's what happened to Pharaoh. Pride got the best of him. Right? He did not submit or follow the Lord, and the sin found out. The sin was pride, and he ended up dying. All right? This is a nice commentary on Pharaoh. Here. Paul writing New Testament to the church in Romans chapter 9, verse 17 and 18 says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same person have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and on whom he will harden it. Eventually God just runs out of runs out of you know runs out of patience, runs out of mercy, runs out of love, and just pff, that's it, Pharaoh. Listen, go to Rome, oh, like, go to Romans chapter one. What is that? That's a great condemnation of of uh, of, of uh, you know future times. They forsook God. They gave up on God. And what's God said? I'll give up on you. You know, I mean Pharaoh could have turned around and repented, but he did not. All right, eventually God runs out of mercy. And we'll close here, verse 9, all right? Uh, I think there's 31 verses here, but I said we can, we're going to spend a few weeks here in, in Exodus, and I, I'm hoping that we're learning some things here. And, and we'll close here at verse 9, but the Egyptians pursued after them all their horses and chariots and Pharaoh and his horsemen and army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside uh, Pihirath and Balzivon. Now it's interesting here that they that they mention that the Israelites here are by the sea. And the sea here is mentioned three times in the first nine verses here. And it's a real interest how God was about to use uh, the sea here and effect a, a second great deliverance of mankind by means of water. Who was the first uh, man that was saved by water? Noah. That's right. You said that done. All right, you're number one on a pizza line a couple of weeks. Actually, we're just gonna we're gonna have just brother God goes first. I mean, let's just get like, come on. You guys gotta. We're gonna have like a when we have like a little Friday night or Saturday night Bible Jeopardy, and I don't know Don. You'll, you'll be like Don, nineteen thousand. You know, <laughs> brother Hank minus four hundred. <laughs> uh, but anyway, God uses water. In a lot of different ways. And this is, again, a little side thing here. It's only going to take a minute, but the water delivered the children of Israel from Pharaoh. Noah and his house were saved through water. All right, again, the children of Israel were saved through water. The bride of Isaac was chosen in a water test. Jacob also found his bride at a water well. The waters of Jordan delivered them into the promised land. Gideon's 300 was selected by what? A water test. Jesus' first miracle changed water into wine. The waters of Bethesda were a scene of a miraculous sign. The pool of Salaam uh, where is where the blind man got healed. Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee. Thus four of the seven signs of the Apostle John were water signs. Jesus Christ declared himself who? The water of life. All right? Jesus declared that all men must be born of water. All right? The pierced side of Jesus yielded both what? Blood, water blood and water. And water. Eh, it's a little, little, side, little side here. You know, a little side, little side uh, thing here. Now, we're going to stop here. We know that there's a, a showdown and a battle brewing here. Uh, we know how it's going to end. Remember the movie, you know, Charlton <laughs> Heston is going to take up this rod. And, well, we, we're going to get there. You know, uh, Someone made a recommendation. I like this. Pastor, maybe you can use a little graphics once in a while. I wish I could just hit the zap, get Charlton Heston, and just, I don't have to preach. We'll just watch it for five minutes. And, uh, <laughs> but hey, how mighty. If we, if we turn the lights off, heck, you're going to go to sleep in it. If, if, like, even during this, this Ten Commandments movie. All right? But how mighty is the grace of water and the grace of God. And remember, we're in the wilderness now, but the end... We get to go to the promised land. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Let's see here. You know what, Brother Alban, I'm going to ask you if you could lead us in a 
and a close in prayer. All right, come on up. All right. I'll give Brother Gordon here a little, a little break. I'll try to get some men here involved. He leads in a little prayer, and then the choir will lead us in a closing benediction.